I'm Lucy Whitfield. I'm a local historian and a women's specialist historian and I run a project called The Women Who Made Me. Sometimes you'll see me like this or like this. But mostly it's just a lot of this. The Women Who Made Me project isn't just about my ancestry. I'd be really, really lucky if I had that amount of interesting female ancestry in my background. No, it's about the women who made you, the women who made me. The idea is that you look again at your female ancestry and reassess it. Don't just dismiss women as being a bit boring because they just got married and kept a house and had kids. There's an awful lot more to women's history than just suffragettes and just motherhood. So the project seeks to look at women through all areas of history and really explore their stories. Now, because I live in Chippenham, I thought I'd introduce you to some of the women I found in the ancestry of the town. So the first thing that people always will think about when they talk about women's history in Chippenham is obviously Florence Hancock. And Florence grew up here. This was Factory Lane, it's now Westmead Lane. And the Pocock and Rawlings, or sometimes Waterford Cloth Bill was just over there. But my project really didn't want to take a look at Florence because a lot of people know quite a bit about her. So rather than just Florence, I decided I'd look at her mother. So her mother was Mary Harding initially. She was one of the early Mormon converts in Wiltshire. The Mormons in Wiltshire were based out at Steeple Ashton, which is uh, just to the south of Trowbridge. And Mary's dad, who was William Offer Harding, were, and his family were some of the really earliest Mormons in the country. And he moved around a lot. Mary moved in, lived in a lot of places when she was growing up. They'd lived in Gloucestershire and they'd lived in Somerset as well as different places in Wiltshire. But she was built, born in Ridivellin, which is near Pontypridd. And there was a big cloth factory based there. But she grew up mostly in Trowbridge. So rather than going out to Utah with the rest of her family and her dad went and her bro dad's brothers and her aunt and even her grandfather, Mary decided she was going to stay here and get married um, to a non-Mormon and his name was Frederick Peckler. They had rather a lot of kids. Unfortunately, most of them died very, very early on within a month or so of birth and Frederick died himself a few years later. And then Mary went and had another baby, it wasn't Frederick's, 13 months after he died would be an impossibility. And sadly, she ended up in the workhouse um, out at Semington. And when she got herself out of the workhouse, she left two daughters in there and came up here to this road and took up with Jacob Hancock. And uh, Jacob Hancock had been married before as well. And between him and Mary, they had 20 children in the end. Some belonged to both of them and some were with their previous partner. And Florence Hancock was one of those. And Mary worked at the cloth factory all the way through, continually as a weaver. Didn't stop when she had tiny babies, she just kept going. Probably breastfed them straight at the machines. And she worked really, really hard. Died when Florence was about 17, but what a woman. When talking about Chippenham history, another character people know quite a bit about is Robin Tanner, who is an etcher and artist, and he taught here at Ivy Lane Primary School. Back then it was an elementary school. So when Robin was here, he was married to his wife, Heather, and a few people know a bit about Heather too in terms of women's history. She was quite a writer. But there was another woman who was very involved with Robin when he was here, and her name was Marion. Marion Young or Miss Young to her pupils and she started here at Ivy Lane in 1929. So she wasn't actually born here, uh, came here when she was two and uh, we reckon probably was educated at St Paul's um, school which at that point was another elementary but when she decided she was going to become a teacher went off and did teacher training in Salisbury and then her first teaching job was at a school in Melksham and then as I said came here in 1929. Robin arrived at the school not long after her and Headmaster Hinton put him in charge of looking at what new ways of teaching art to the students. He had lots of innovative ideas about how they could approach art at the time and was put in charge of that project. 
and to support him in that, the headmaster asked Marion to give him a hand. Now, Marion at the time was in charge of the embroidery side of things, mostly working with the girls, but she collaborated with Robin on ideas around this art using embroidery, and they worked very, very well together. Packages of Robin's art and Marion's embroidery went out to various different educational institutions and conferences as an example about what could be done for, with new ways of teaching art at the time. And the headmaster loved Marion's contribution because it meant that the girls were slightly more involved and also the kids who were perhaps a little bit slower to learn could be involved too. So it was really, really beneficial. So Marion was part of that new epoch in teaching art. In 1940, there were a huge amount of evacuees who had come into Chippenham, and this school was absolutely bursting at the seams. So they set up a new temporary secondary school up at the old grammar school on Cockerbury Road, and Marion went there with the older pupils. And while she was there, it, the new school dinners initiative came in and she was in charge of that for the school and funnily enough for an unmarried teacher they also put her in charge of sex education women weren't actually allowed to be married and teachers until 1944 so she was part of that movement and with the marriage bar and she was there until 1956 when the girls school split off and went to Harden Hewish and she went to Harden Hewish with them and she became deputy head at Harden Hewish and also taught English and retired in the 60s and is now resident in St Paul's Churchyard because she died in the late 70s. So we're at St Peter's Church in Langley Borough and uh, this is associated with Thermusis and Lucy Ash who were daughters of Squire Robert Ash and this was the church he was reverend of and they are mentioned in Kilvert's diary. So for Musis, who was the eldest daughter of the three, uh, she was uh, she became Lady of the Manor once um, her father had died and she inherited the, the land and she was really involved in church uh, matters and conservative association matters. She also took up archery too, but she very much was the Lady of the Manor here. Youngest sister Lucy, there was Emily in the middle, she was entirely different, sisters as different as chalk and cheese. Lucy was a big supporter of the Labour Party and in the very early 20th century she went off to London, turned her back on all the, the high living here and went off and lived in Southwark and worked with the poor and worked to try and improve the lives of the poor and she was there for about 40 years um, working as a social worker in the early days before it was even really a profession. So she was there and came back here just as World War II was happening when bombs were falling and most of Southwark thought that she'd been taken out by a bomb but she actually came back here and lived here for the rest of her life and there's a memorial to Lucy and to Thermusis in this churchyard here behind me. And this is the Kew Hill House. So this was the residence of Caroline Matilda Dixon and she had it built in 1895 after a fire up here. Now she was the sister of the MP of Chippenham who was elected in 1892 who was John Poinder Dixon and they were of the Poinder family who are based over at or certainly were at the time over at Harton Park at Corsham. Caroline moved here eventually uh, after a fire in about 1894 and she designed the rather stately pile of stones you can see behind me. It, this, this one was built in 1895 designed by Silcock and Ray architects Bath but from her own ideas and design. She's even got her initials on the wall over there. And Caroline's dad had been a, an army officer. He'd had three kids, then uh, their mum died, and Caroline gained a stepmother who she lived with here for, for quite a bit of her life later on. Her father died in the Earl of Wight, which is partly where Caroline grew up. She'd also been on the Royal Crescent in Bath. But after he died they ended up moving to Harton Park and then to here. She doesn't appear to have done too much of note locally apart from having built this house but died here in 1939 and the house has now become part of the Westinghouse complex. Monkton House just behind me that's part of the Monkton Park estate and it's a big old manor and it's been around for a very long time uh, since medieval times really 
And once the Edridges and the Esmeets, who were the original uh, gentry families, had done with this place, it was taken over by West Audrey, who was a local solicitor. And then when he'd gone, it was taken over by the Coventry family, and they came from Scotland originally. Lady Muriel married her cousin, who was Henry uh, Coventry, in 1893, up at uh, Charlton Park near Malmesbury, and they moved here in 1894. So when she came here, they had three kids and she joined almost immediately the Board of Guardians for Chippenham. Now, the Board of Guardians was all part of the Poor Law Union, so associated with the workhouse, which is now St Andrew's Hospital or the hospital on, uh, up on Randon Hill. And she was a very, very early board member and really cared deeply about the people of the town. I was very, very generous with her, with her time and her money and gave a lot of uh, both of them to the people of the town. And in 1928, she became only the second woman um, on the Chippenham bench of magistrates. And that was quite trailblazing, particularly of the time. And uh, she was cared so deeply about the uh, what was there at that point, the institution rather than the workhouse. It had changed in 1931 that she furnished a room up, up at the workhouse, the, the institution, um, out of her own pocket for girls of the town who had been brought up there who didn't have a home to go to and they considered the workhouse, the institution, their home. So they uh, they could go there and live there and Lady Muriel actually set that up. And there's a street named after her, Lady Coventry Road, and it's just over there in Moncton Park. For the next one, we've come up to what was the Chippenham Workhouse, uh, built in 1857. And Martha, she was born Martha Smith and later became Martha Gain, was matron here for a very, very long time. What usually happened with poor law workhouses was that a married couple would become master and matron. And that's what Martha and her husband James did here in the late 1860s. Now, they hadn't always been involved in the poor law unions. Uh, when Ma uh, Martha married James, he was actually an accountant like her dad. She'd been brought up by her accountant father in Bath. But when she married James, he didn't seem to stay an accountant for very long. He had lots of different jobs and didn't seem to stick at them very often. Um, so it quite, felt, quite often fell to Martha to actually supplement their income. So she became a dressmaker for, um, on a, for a few years. But when they came here, they really seemed to flourish. They had five kids, three older daughters and two young sons, and they moved in here um, at Rowden Hill House, just down the, the road a little tiny bit. And they were, they were mostly based here. And Martha's role as matron was very much about the domestic care of the people in the workhouse. So she was in charge of the nursing staff and the, all the food and the looking after arrangements really of the people that came in here. And they would have been fairly awful circumstances that would have driven people into a workhouse. So not a lot of money, not a lot of prospects, jobs failing and that sort of stuff. But the workhouse here actually was one of the better ones. Uh, there was, it wasn't so much creature comforts, but certainly they went on, they educated people very well. And they even had a workhouse band at one point. They had a bandmaster on the staff. So Martha and James stayed here for nearly 30 years, longest serving master and matron of this workhouse at any given time. And they were here until the very, very late 1890s when they retired home to Bath. Now I'm also going to tell you about what another resident who was here uh, while Martha and James were master and matron, and that's a woman called Rosanna, Rosanna Bright. Now she was actually disabled, came from a family over in Cologne, sort of way, agricultural family, and they were working in the fields. And because of Rosanna's disability, she was in and out of the workhouse quite a lot. And she's unusual because she seems to have had an awful lot of illegitimate pregnancies of babies that didn't really live very long. And she made the newspaper um, for a, a birth that occurred here. Um, James wrote to the newspaper and said about it. And she actually gave birth to triplets while she was in here in 1890. And the, the three little girls, they were Lily, Violet and Rose. Sadly, they didn't live much beyond their second birthday, any of them, I think. Yeah, one maybe that lasted a week and then go on from there. Um, but 
Rosanna did actually end up marrying the boiler man from the workhouse and I uh, went, uh, went off with him and ended up having several more children and two of those actually grew up to adulthood. So the workhouse was very much an important part of Rosanna's life. It provided her comfort but it also found her someone to love and gave her some more stability. So when Elizabeth first came to Chippenham, she lived here at the Rose and Crown. It was her father's brother's pub and she worked behind the bar as a barmaid. It was from here that Elizabeth married her first husband, who was William Lewis. He lived just a bit down there and he was a master shoemaker. They had one son who died when he was 12 and then William followed quite soon afterwards. So she was a widow. Once William had died, Elizabeth had a bit more money around. She inherited it from him and she lived on her own quite comfortably in Chippenham for quite a little while. Eventually, 1881, she married a man called James Utterson and James had been the registrar of births and deaths for Chippenham for a very, very long time. He was a widower. He had a son, but the son died quite early again. So Elizabeth and James were pretty happy for three years and then James died. He was quite a bit older than Elizabeth. And again, Elizabeth had more money around. And as a good Christian woman, with no dependents, Elizabeth decided to set up a charity for the poor women of the town. And her legacy to the town are these almshouses that were built in 1884. So the next woman is a lady called Sarah. And she was born Sarah Tanner, and by the 1840s was running a, a food shop on the high street with her big sister. But Sarah went, Sarah went and married a guy who ran the Bear Hotel behind us, a guy called Joseph Buckle. And he'd been married before and he had two children from his first wife and they had two more children together and unfortunately when Sarah was pregnant with their second one he died very suddenly and Sarah ended up taking over the Bear Hotel herself. Joseph Buckle her first husband died in 1873 and Sarah took over the entire pub and ran it with the help of her stepchildren and her own children and a few years later she married a guy called Walter Hickling who was a former soldier and they ran it together for a while uh, because he was a man he was the one that had to take on the license not Sarah. They ran the pub together for a few years but decided to give it up in the end and they moved to St Mary Street. They had another couple of daughters and then unfortunately Walter went and died so she was widowed for the second time. So when her second husband died Sarah came and set up a pub here which at that point was the Wine and Spirits Vaults. There were two pubs either side and she ran that for a while and then she moved down to what was the Three Cups in the lower, lower bit of the marketplace but she changed that to the Tolbert Hotel and she ran that until she retired and then she went and helped her son Joe Buckle out with his poultry shop on the high street. Now we come to Sister Josephine. Sadly, not quite as much of a character as the Jake Thackeray song would have, but she's pretty interesting anyway. And she used to spend rather a lot of time here at St Mary's Church, old St Mary's Church. They built the new one in the 20s and 30s, I think. So her first name actually wasn't Josephine, it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Twomey. And she was Irish. She came over in famine uh, in Ireland around about the mid 1840s with her parents, who died rather quickly and then left her sister with her to be looked after. And she ended up being a teacher here at the Catholic school. It was while she was teaching here that she decided she actually wanted to become a nun herself. So she went and joined an order of the uh, Joseph of Anansi and with a couple of other nuns who had come over from India, they founded the first in English mission of that order over in Devizes. That's still there actually. While she was in Devizes, they would still, her and the other two nuns, come over here every Sunday to play the harmonium for mass. So she was still very involved. In 1866, she became mother superior of her own convent down on Marshfield Road and set up her own little school. Now in Devizes, there'd been a huge amount of opposition to the, the school there. The, people, the local people had decided that nuns were witches, they would stone them, they were really opposed to them. Here, there doesn't seem to have been so much of a problem and that convent continued. But didn't really have many pupils, mostly rich Catholic widows was the, was the general people that came in. 
that convent shut about 20 years later and the sisters first moved to Malmesbury and Josephine was in charge there she was mother superior there and then eventually she went over to Newport and ran a huge convent school there and she died there aged 93 in the 30s. Annie Payton, another of my women, lived here on St Paul Street. Uh, she came here with her mum and her sister in the 1870s. Annie had been born in Sierra Leone. Her parents were uh, Christian missionaries who were based out in Freetown. And Annie and her older sister were both born there, but were sent home to London to be educated in a mi uh, missionary school. Um, and Annie was literally only a toddler when that happened. So she was separated from her parents at a very young age. After a little while, they actually moved from here and moved around the corner to what was then Land's End, uh, but is now sort of the junction between Park Lane and Marshfield Road. And it was then that things started to unravel a little bit for Annie. Her mum went back to Sierra Leone and she was sent to live with an aunt in London. And she had an illness that weakened her and a love affair that went wrong. And her mental health suffered and her aunt put her in Bethlehem Asylum, which is in London. Her mum came home, decided that she could take care of Annie herself and brought her back to Chippenham. But Annie really went downhill. She developed pica, she heard voices, she insisted that neighbours were persecuting her and she would write out pieces of scripture on pieces of paper and hand them out to pe random people in the street. And naturally they were worried, so they put her in roundway asylum over in Devizes. Her mum decided at some point that she could look after her again and wrote to the, asy the asylum saying how grateful she was for her care of the, of the darling Annie. But it lasted six weeks and she really couldn't cope with Annie at home. So Annie was put back in Roundway Asylum and she remained there until she died in 1914. Her mum died here in the 1880s. Her sister haven't quite found out where she went off, but the case is in the uh, medical files for Roundway Asylum and it's really harrowing reading. Engineer Roland Brotherhood moved here to Orwell House in 1841 with his wife Priscilla. Roland Brotherhood's iron end and engineering works were mostly here in the, around the back of the station but mostly what people know about Roland Brotherhood other than the fact that he was an engineer and ran some iron works was that he had a cricket team's worth of sons which in Victorian terms meant that he was very virile and doing his good for the country but what people don't usually talk about is that there was somebody who had to carry and give birth and breastfeed and raise those children plus three daughters and that was his wife Priscilla and in addition to that she actually acted as cashier and accountant for his business in the early days too she would be up making up bags of wages and going to you know, and visiting banks to get hold of money and various things like that so she was really involved with that lot as well as raising all those children the late 1860s this business declined and Roland and Priscilla went off to Cardiff uh, under a bit of a cloud really um, and downsized their house so she had to cope without servants poor dear and they were there for a few years and then gradually he built his business back up and ended up in Bristol and Roland and Priscilla are buried in Arnosvale Cemetery. So I really hope you've enjoyed my whistle stop tour of some of the more interesting women in Chippenham's history. My point is always that these women are part of the very fabric of society. They're there in every walk of life. They're landladies, they're landowners. They give, make bequests. They are generally involved in everything that a town does and has to offer. Your challenge now is to go away and reevaluate your women, your female ancestors. Don't just look at them as wives and mothers, see their whole life. Don't just say they weren't a suffragette so they weren't interesting. Actually look at what they did, how they interacted with society, how they lived their whole life. <laughs>